step inside the walls of the 25-year leader in classic and custom boat restorations. Watch as the meticulous craftsmen use the most advanced materials and processes in the industry to restore, repair, and build some of the most beautiful boats on the water, including their own Matan Classic Collection. Hi folks, I'm Mike Borelli. Here at Matan, we custom build classic style vessels and perform restorations on boats we refer to as the family heirloom. We also take on fiberglass repairs sent to us from across the country with the client's confidence that vessel will be returned better than new. From the very beginning, our work was described as meticulous and I often told to be anal retentive. And this is Making It Matan. You are joining us at our under construction, almost completed, new assembly shop. Hello and welcome to Making It Matan. I'm Mike Borelli. We are on our fourth episode following the custom build to two Matan Classic Collection Pelham Bay 21s. One being finished as an inshore sport fish, one being finished as a classic center console. And in the last episode, I mentioned we're about to go into the most fun and cool part of the builds. That is the rigging and the outfitting of these boats. And the first phase of the rigging and the outfitting is the systems. The first system is the fuel system. And that begins with the installation to the fuel tanks. In most instances, we have our fuel tanks for our new boats, as well as our restorations and repairs, fabricated locally. We spread our business out equally between two longtime New England metal shops, Kent Fabrications, Cape Cod Welding. They've been providing us aluminum constructed, U.S. Coast Guard certified fuel tanks for over 25 years. Before we install the fuel tanks, there's two key processes we need to do to ensure the longevity of the fuel tanks. The first is coating the fuel tank surfaces. The benefits of coating an aluminum fuel tank is an ongoing difference of opinion in the industry. Aluminum, over time, forms an oxide on the surface that protects the surface over long periods of time. And applying a coating prevents this process from happening. However, in a marine environment, prolonged exposure to moisture and chemicals will beat out that aluminum oxide and begin the process of corrosion. Since clearly we are building these vessels for the long haul, Knowing over time any enclosed cavity below the waterline is going to produce some sort of condensation, we coated the tanks in an epoxy based coating system. Second key process, and the most important, whether the tank is coated or not, is applying rubber strips between the surface of the fuel tank and the surface that the tank is against. Whether it is the bare hull or like our Pelham Bays, an independent fuel well. It's not just the presence of these strips, but the application of how these strips are glued to the surface of the tanks. When we glue the rubber strips to the surface of the fuel tanks, we did it in a manner to ensure the rubber was set in a full bed of 3M5200. Acting as a gasket between the aluminum surfaces and the rubber, if you do not use sealer or simply put a couple of beads, it'll cause water to get trapped under the rubber and accelerate the erosion of the aluminum. There is your hole. As you can see here on a recent fuel tank replacement project, this is a common problem that we have run into over the years with multiple manufacturers not taking the time to properly adhere the rubber strips and in our opinion putting them in the wrong direction making it even more likely to trap water 
We let the 5200 dry for a couple of days and installed the tanks. Those brackets that hold the tank in are screwed into the Penske board that we put into the layup of the deck very early on. When we return, we'll get into the wiring and hose runs needed to be completed before installing the main deck hatch. With the Sportfish having way more going on than the Special Edition, which we'll get into after this break. With the fuel tanks installed, we ran 3 8 hose for the feed, 5 8 hose for the vent, an inch and a half hose for the filler. Securing each end of the hose to the tank fittings, doubling up on the clamps. We needed to cut the other end approximately to length. To be hooked up later after we fed the hoses to the rigging tubes, that protruded out of the main deck hatch. We ran the wiring needed to ground the fuel tank, as well as the wiring needed for the fuel sender. To ground the tank, we used the number 10 green wire with a second number 10 green to the deck filler, tying both together on a protected ground. We then ran two number 14 wires one green to the ground the fuel sender, and one pink to the fuel sender, which we later tied into the Yamaha Mercury harnesses. I mentioned that the Sportfish had way more going on on the deck than the Special Edition. We had quite a bit of rigging to accommodate the plumbing needed for the bait well and the saltwater washdown system. Well, you know the saying about 10 pounds of you know what in a five pound bag? We needed to do just that, make it look good. For the bait well, we ran an inch and an eighth sanitation hose for the discharge and a three quarter inch sanitation hose for the fill and circulation pump, along with another three quarter inch hose for the salt water supply to the wash down pump. Utilizing the composite brackets to hold the fuel tank in place, we use P-clamps to hold the hoses by machine fastening the clamps to the composite bracket. We talked about installing these fuel tanks with the longevity in mind. Well, that means anything and everything below the main deck hatch is being installed for the long haul. With the below deck rigging completed on both boats, Gary began installing the deck hatches, feeding the hoses and the wiring up through the rigging tubes, later to be fitted to the corresponding deck filler, vent, and pumps. While Gary worked installing the deck hatches, I continued with the plumbing and the rigging to the bait well. We designed this system using a flow right bait well pump system with their patented circulation control valve. Along with installing the bait well pump, I installed twin Rule LP900 bilge pumps. These bilge pumps mount vertically, making for a neat installation up against the transom. You are also able to set a low and high water level so the high level pump becomes a less used backup bilge pump. With the rigging and the plumbing to the bait well and the bilge pumps completed, I installed the necessary hose fittings to the bait well tank, along with the control lever for the circulation valve and the switch to the Johnson saltwater washdown pump. Now that the below deck systems were installed, we needed to install two very different decking products used on these builds, and we'll get into that and much more when we return. <laughs> Hello. 
Hello, we're back. A final detail to the new builds and restorations is how we finish off the decks. You saw in earlier episodes with the restoration to the classic Seacraft, when we finished off the deck in a painted non-skid design. With these two builds, we used one product that is featured on almost all of the classic collections. That product is simulated teak decking system manufactured by Plasdeck. This is a PVC product that if you didn't know any better, you would think it's real teak. And you know what? It's the only teak decking company that manufactures its product in the U.S. of A. The second product we used was a requested product by a client that we had not installed on any other new boats to date. That product is called Sea Deck. Sea Deck is a closed cell polyethylene foam which has become very popular on both fresh and saltwater fishing vessels. Plasdeck and Sea Deck products are very different in look, feel, and installation. However, the preparation of the existing surface is the same. It starts with a detergent wash scrubbing into a chemical double wipe down. Remember, these boats come out of a wax mold. We needed to be sure that we removed any and all waxes from the surface to ensure the adhesion of the adhesive. Sea Deck uses a less permanent peel and stick adhesive backing, making the insulation a bit less labor intensive. Joe and I took our time familiarizing ourselves with the product and easily completed the application of the sections to the Sportfish model. Joe and Stan then teamed up to install the Plasdeck Teak Deck in the Special Edition model, going through the identical preparation of both the detergent and chemical wash. Plasdeck uses a hybrid moisture-cured adhesive to bond their decking material. This product is applied with a notch trowel, giving us like 20, 30 minutes of working time. And when it dries, that's it. Done right, this product does not lift. In order for these projects to come together timely, there are multiple phases of the build going on at the same time. A good example is, very early on in the assembly, Chucky began the fabrication of the mahogany and teak components to both builds. On the Sportfish, he fabricated the beautiful mahogany combing boards. Wow. And the inner mahogany gunnel slats. That's going to look awesome for you. Yeah. He then moved on to fabricating the teak backrest. gunnel rod holders to the special edition. Once again, we relied on our partners at Teak Isle to supply us with the teak louvered doors for both models. All finished in the TAN's high gloss, all grip coating system. Two other phases of the build that had been going on was the wiring and metal fabrications, which we will get into when we return. At this stage, the boats are beginning to be customized according to the way they're going to be used. 
The most enjoyable part of the build for me is the wiring and the rigging of the systems prior to all that fancy stuff going on, or as I call it, fluff fluff. During this last segment, we're going to work through the two phases that needed to be completed, so when we return next time, we can finish up the final assembly, get these boats on the water, more importantly, in the hands of our clients. Both these phases were going on at the same time. I was focused in my zone, laying out the DC wiring systems. Gary was working in the metal shop, fabricating the bow rail, handrails, and the Z legs to the RPS helm seat for the special edition. Starting with the DC wiring system for the Sportfish, started with a blank piece of starboard, masked it off, drawing on the masking tape. I laid out the battery switches, circuit breakers, fuse block, and grounding bars, and where they were gonna be located. Using a circuit breaker panel, I broke the accessories into three fuse panels. One fuse panel for the accessories outside the console, another fuse panel for the accessories in or on the console, and lastly, a third fuse panel for the pump systems, the bilge, the bait well, and the washdown. I utilized marine DC color-coded wires for each accessory, separating the ground leads into three colors. Green for the protected ground for the fuel tank, black for the pump system, and yellow grounds for the accessories. To make the wire into the Sportfish a bit more interesting and the boat a bit more cooler, our client requested incorporating a Minn Kota trolling motor into the build requiring a DC wiring system to be a three battery system. Using a BEP battery management cluster, which I tweaked a bit, I was able to isolate each battery and instead of a parallel switch, I made the parallel switch into a series switch, bringing two 12 volt batteries into series creating 24 volts for the trolling motor to run on. This Minn Kota setup, along with the Humminbird and Yamaha, is something to see in operation. The special edition wiring we did similar to the Sportfish, with a lot less going on, and at the same time we were also wiring a Davenport 17, where the under console wiring is identical to the Pelman Bay. So we killed two birds with one stone and got that done as well. What we did differently on the special edition was to lay out the electrical utilizing a piece of foam core as a template to the underside, the dash where we'd be mounting electrical components. This way we were able to lay out the DC system fabricate the harness as it would be going into the boat, making it easy for us to transfer and mount in the console. What we have here now is the rough wiring for our Davenport and Pelham Bay. We will now be moving each one of these setups over to our consoles where we will bring our wiring harness from each boat into the console to tie it into our harness. Running the harnesses through the rigging tubes and then to each system and or accessory. While we were able to complete most of the wiring underneath the console, while the consoles were out of the boat, Gary was able to begin his metal fabrication. The whole objective to the classic collections is to keep them classic looking. However, no different than how we made structural improvements over the originals, we also make improvements to the individual classic parts that we replicate. The bow rail we fabricated in stainless steel like the original classics. However, not using the old chrome over bronze railing fittings and stanchions that always loosen up and no matter how much you tighten that old set screw, First two waves, it's loose again. 
All of the seams and stanchions are welded. Gary fabricated the bow railing in sections using a hydraulic tube inventor. When he had everything exactly where he wanted it, he tack welded the sections together. Once he had it tacked in place, then the craftsmanship really kicked in. He took his time and welded everything together. And that's just half the craftsmanship. Because after that, he ground, sanded, and polished each one of those welds like it was a piece of jewelry. Improving on the classic Z legs of the helm seat, we fabricate the tan Z legs out of aluminum. We just recently fabricated the first set in stainless steel, increasing the height four inches just as we did with the consoles. Like the bow railing, we started by bending aluminum pipe using a hydraulic pipe bender. Which, yes, there's a difference between a pipe bender and a tube and bender. After bending the pipe, Gary set the parts in the jig and tack weld them together. And once again, that incredible craftsmanship kicked in. And he final welded the parts together, leaving a finished weld to stay on display, although in this case, under multiple glossy coats of all grip finish. With the bow rail in the RPS seat complete, wiring and rigging to the consoles complete, and the systems complete, we are on the home stretch of getting these Pelham Bays on the water, which we will do next time. So stay tuned. I'm Mike Borelli. See you next time on Making It Matan.